Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord again. Bless the Lord again, people of God. Hallelujah. God is a good God and He's worthy of praise and He's worthy to be praised. Let me welcome us tonight again to another session in our series that we have been doing on doctrine. Amen. And, you know, it's just so good to be alive and to be able to, you know, share in a word with us. Amen. Just before I go any further, let me just open in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you tonight for your mercies and we want to thank you for your love. And we want to thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us and for that which you have been doing. Lord, in the midst of a pandemic, you are still keeping, you are still providing, you are still taking care of your own. Lord, we want to come before you tonight to just present, Lord, this Bible study as we get in the word, as we talk about doctrine. Lord, we pray that you will be in our midst. Lord, we pray that every word that go forth tonight, Lord, will go forth with an anointing, God, and will accomplish your divine will. We ask, God, that you touch every heart tonight that tune in, God, and even those in the future that will tune in. We pray, God, that you will have in store a blessing for them. And we pray that when all is said and done tonight, that your perfect will be done. We give you thanks right now in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. So again, welcome each and every one. And we, like I said earlier on, that we are dealing with doctrine. We are talking about doctrine. And let me make it clear that by no means can we, in this, these sessions, cover everything as it pertains to doctrine. We are just, you know, talking about some of the things that we feel led and feel impressed to talk about. You know, because surely if we get into the depths of doctrine and then we go into the doctrine of itself and all that the apostles taught, you know, surely we will not be able to complete. So our team scripture is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, and we have been reading it for a couple of weeks. It says, No, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with an hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Amen. So let us go to also to Second Timothy 4, 1 through to 4. Paul now said to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Amen. Amen. So last week we spent some time and we actually look at why sound doctrine is important. And as usual, we always try to do a little bit of recap you know, to, you know, strengthen our points and for those who are just joining, joining in so that they could kind of get an idea of where we are coming from um, and to see where we are today. So we did say that sound doctrine, you know, is important because our faith is based upon a specific message. And we said that that message is found in second. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we say that our faith, faith is based up on a specific message. And this is one of the reasons why sound doctrine is important. Because our faith is based upon a specific message. And this message is the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So Christ died, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he was buried, rose again on the third day according to the scripture and we said that this was one of the greatest this is the greatest message that has ever preached and it is not out of style it is not still it has been preached from the day christ died until now we are still preaching about the death burial resurrection and the ascension of jesus christ this message is important to the existence of the church and it is important for the savings of soul. And the message was preached on the day of Pentecost. And is still being preached today. The problem that we are having though. Is that even though the message is being preached today. We come to find out. The scripture said it. And it, was, it is not just happening now. It is from in time past. And the scripture says it. Right? That we have men today who are being used by Satan himself. And they are preaching lies. And they are preaching things that are not scriptural. And they are coming up with all kind of doctrines. And nowadays what is happening is that men have turned from the truth. And they have believed a lie. And in a time like this, you know, I'm just feeling... You know, uh, this burden. We are in a time right now where we have got to be resolute that, you know, we are serving God. And, and Joshua said, those who are on the Lord's side, serve him. Right? And it's important that if we are on the Lord's side today that we need to serve him because we are in a time, church, where... We can't get to come to church. We have been saying it for a couple past weeks. And right now, we can't get to come to church as we want to. The service that we used to come to, all of the service, we used to be so caught up during the week with service. No, we can't come to service anymore. No, when I look at how I have to push myself to, to, to pray and to fast and to do everything, can you imagine somebody who just barely pushing through in a time like this when we are not able to come to church? You find out that some of the folks are not so in tune and, you know, people tend to remove themselves. And we have also said that <clears throat> one of the things that is happening is that many Persons are preaching and teaching online and they are not preaching the truth. And men who are safe, who know the truth, has now turned from the truth and they are believing a lie. I believe that we are in a time where we have to fight for what we believe in. We have to fight for this salvation, for this doctrine that has been presented to us. This doctrine that has been passed down to us by our forefathers. And as people of God, we must be aware of what is happening and we have got to be resolute in our minds that we are going to stand up in this day and age for that which we have received. Amen. Our eternal destiny depends upon the hearing the word of God and hearing the word of truth. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again according to the scripture. Ephesians 1 and 13 tells us, In whom he also trusted, right? After that, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that, he believed, he was sealed with the spirit of promise. So after we hear this word, after we hear the word, the gospel preached, Right, we trusted in God. 
and we receive salvation and we were sealed the bible said with the spirit of promise our eternal destiny depends upon hearing the word of god christ died like i said for our sins and rose again on the third day the second reason why we said that doctrine is important sound doctrine is important was because it is a sacred trust um, sound doctrine is important because it's a sacred trust and we dare not tamper with the communication of God to the world. Our duty as preachers and teachers is to preach the word, to teach the word, to minister the undiluted word to souls and those who hear and are interested to make a change and interested to conform to God will be saved. Jude conveyed the message in verse 3 and verse 4, Jude, Jude urged, urged the saints to fight for what they have received. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was entrusted to us. Sound doctrine is important because it helps us to understand that the, this gospel is a sacred trust and it was passed down on to us. Jude's concern was about the faith. His concern was about the good news, the gospel. And he urged those who he wrote to at that time to contain for the faith. Today, like I started out by saying, it's important for us as children of God to contend for the faith that was passed down to us. We are the front runners now, and chances are uh, everything that is happening is pointing to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But just, it might just be that Jesus tarry another 10 years. Probably 10 years, some of us won't be on the scene. Hence, we have to now pass that baton to somebody else. So we have to stand up for the truth, stand up for this doctrine, and pass it on to our children. We have to fight because our life depends on it. We have to fight because the future of the church, the future of our children depend on it. Amen. So this gospel that we preach, the death, burial, resurrection, and a sense of ascension of Jesus Christ. The same message was passed down to us. Paul gives a similar warning in Galatians 1.6. He said, though we are an angel, preach any other gospel unto you. Let him be. He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that had called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. As we said before, so say I know again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that he have received, let him be accursed. This faith that is entrusted to us by God, this faith that we must contend for is grounded in Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Word, and He is the one that gave His life for us. In him we live, in him we move, 
in him we have our being. Jesus is his name. And we have a sure message. We have a solid foundation on which we can stand. The third point we mention, sound doctrine is important because what we believe affects what we do. We mentioned last week that two individuals will be in a certain place and they will do two, they will do different things. A sinner will operate different from a person that is saved. A person that is saved, grounded in the word, and is walking in the teachings of the apostle will behave a certain way. While a sinner will behave another way. So sound doctrine is important because what we believe affects what we do. So now that we are in Christ and we believe certain things, we behave differently. The Bible says any man be in Christ is a new creature. All things, the things that we used to do, the things that we used to double in, we're not doing them anymore because now we have learned Christ and now our life has been transformed by Jesus Christ and we are trying our very best to do the things that God wants us to do. The sinner will do sinful things and it is just the norm to him. But the Christian will do Christ-like things because his thought process have changed. Know that we are safe. Our thinking have changed. And the things that we used to do, we do them no more. So true teaching promotes righteousness. Sin flourishes where sound doctrine is absent. Where sound doctrine is opposed, sin flourishes. That is why it's important for us as children of God to stand firm and to stand rooted in this doctrine, in the teachings of the apostle. Because any time we begin to accept something which is not something, we are going to find ourselves in problem and we are going to find that we, that we start accepting teachings that comes along with a certain kind of doctrine. We are going to find ourselves now doing things that we should not do. Sound doctrine will tell us the ways of God and transform our minds that we might be able to live how the Lord wants us to live. We also said sound doctrine is important because we must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. So we said last week that we see it around us. Everything around us is false. You have the false eyelash. You can't, you can't just look at somebody and, and, and know that it's a male and know that it's a female because right now male want to be female and female and the, the thing is just so mixed up. And it just seems like everything around us is false. Only the word and the people that are living for God are truth, speak truth and live truth. Right? So everything around us is just in falsehood. And this is the way of Satan. He's a liar, the Bible says from the beginning. He's the father of lie. And if it's not true, then it's lie. And anything that is a lie, it is in falsehood. Amen. Matthew 13, 25, there, there are tears among the weeds, and we must be aware of that. Acts 20, verses 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So when we come and we talk about doctrine and we talk about, you know, that men are teaching things and men will come in unaware Wolves in sheep clothing. People might think that, look here, we're just talking, but is the Bible, if we, our faith is in God and if we trust the word of God and we live by the word of God, it is the word of God that says in Acts 20, verses 29, that grievous wolves 
will enter in among you. Not enter in the world, but enter in the church. And it will not, this wolf will not spear the flock. So the sole purpose for coming in is to destroy. The Bible says that Satan come to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And these wolves, which are agents of Satan, when they disguise themselves, I want us to understand that some of these persons that you see preaching, and you see them say they work in miracles. Is it no miracle? A kingdom, the Bible says, cannot fight against the kingdom. Something might be staged. And it seems like a miracle is work, but no miracle. I want us to know, church, that we must be aware that, that these things, these shows sometimes are put on to captivate the mind of the saved person. Nothing not happening at my church. I don't see nobody getting up out of any wheelchair. I don't see any cancer person being healed. I don't see this. I don't see that. And the man of God, the men of God that are teaching the truth, you get up and walk and leave them because you want a sign. You want to see things. Jesus said to the folks that look here, is a wicked generation that seek a sign. And as individuals, we like to see somebody getting up out of a wheelchair and we like to see persons say, look here, I'm healed. But a lot of these things are staged just to capture and captivate some folks. And when you look, you see these people have a whole lot of person following their ministry. And they will never tell you the truth. They will never tell you how to be saved. And they will never tell you the truth. Because all that they want is for a person to fat up their ministry. But I want us to know that the Bible says in Acts, that grievous wolves will enter in and they will not spear the flock. The best way to distinguish truth from falsehood, we said, is to know truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. To know truth is to know Jesus Christ because Christ is truth. 1 John 2, verses 22. Right? It's a who is the liar if it's not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Sound doctrine is important because we must ascertain truth in a world of falsehood. Everything around us is false. I mean, even some of the things that Persons come and they talk about COVID and we have a whole heap of things sending out. Persons will come and they talk. But as researchers, we know that, look here, you have to present credible data. And a lot of persons come and they talk and we don't see any data. And, you know, a whole lot of persons are scared and, and persons say that they're not taking the vaccine. And some persons, look here, we are living in a world where there's just falsehood. And the age of technology where once somebody says something, it reaches a million people. And the person might not even be talking truth. And what we are seeing right around us is just falsehood. In a world, in a world of falsehood, we need the truth. And sound doctrine is important because it presents the truth in a world of falsehood. Sound doctrine is important because at the end of sound doctrine is life. Amen. 1 Timothy 4 verse 16 tells us that. Amen. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt save both Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. For in doing so, 
you shall save yourself and them that hear you. So it is important because at the end of sound doctrine, it is life. The scripture that we read says, take heed unto thy the doctrine, continue in them. For if you do so, you shall save yourself and you shall save even those that hear you. Amen. Bless the Lord. So, principles to remember from all of that. Truth comes by divine revelation. There is no better teacher of divine truth than the Holy Ghost. Or the Holy Spirit. Which is the art of scriptures. Truth is baffling to the unregenerated mind. And can only be understood when the spirit makes them clear and a lot of us can attest to this when we baffled with the oneness of God and the revelation that comes from the Holy Ghost as it pertains to baptism it was not until the Holy Spirit revealed it to us then we get that full understanding the Bible in St. John 16, verses 13. It tells us. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Let us also look at 1 Corinthians 2 verses 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit. And this is what we are saying now. We are saying that the, 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 the unregenerated mind cannot understand the things of God. The natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. The, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. I said to us a couple of weeks ago that we need not to go forth. And we need not to have a shouting match with anybody. We need not to go to any length and breadth in any argument. To defend any kind of belief that we have. Even though the Bible says that we must be ready to give an answer to any man that asks. But there is no need for us to get into a shouting match. To get into any form of debate. Especially with an unregenerated mind. Because they cannot understand the things of the spirit. So, one of the things that will help us to understand sound doctrine and the teaching is just to know that, look here, the revelation comes from the Holy Ghost himself because the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. So, other than the, the, another point to note, another, other than the Holy Spirit, Scripture is best interpreted by Scripture. And we said it a couple of weeks ago. And we read from the scripture, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. And we're going to read it again. It says, who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For a precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So other than the Holy Spirit, the scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. So these are just take away now, you know, from the, from, from, from the whole presentation now and doctrine and why it is important and the meaning. These, this is, these are just take away points. Truth, the third point, truth is always in agreement with the whole tenure of scripture, what we have seen is that men have taken section of the Bible, section of scriptures, and have established doctrine. 
However, doctrine should never be established on one isolated passage. If this is so, then the doctrine becomes null and void. In essence, a doctrine must be proven, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, the message must be the same. And as we get down and we look at repentance, and as we look at God call upon man to repent, we are going to see that God has been calling man from the Old Testament. He has been calling nation from the Old Testament. And then come over into the New Testament, he has still been calling men. So when we talk about doctrine and talk about the teachings of the apostles, the teaching that Jesus Christ left now with the apostles, what Jesus did taught them and these men now pass it down to us. And when we search the scripture, we recognize that from the Old Testament, the same thing was preached. In the New Testament, it's the same thing that the apostles preached. It's the same thing that Jesus preached. So it must be established with the whole tenure of scripture, somebody, that is why the Bible says, line upon line and precept upon precept. And church, we must be wise in this time. We can't listen to some new thing and say, look here, this is a new thing. Because, and, it, and it's pleasing and it's so good. Don't remove the whole landmark. I want to embrace the teachings of old. I want to embrace the teachings of Jesus Christ. I want to embrace the teachings of the apostles. In the scriptures, these scriptures, these words, amen, we have life. We find life. We find the way of pleasing the Lord if we follow these words. So, Doctrine should never be established on one isolated scripture, but it should be consistent through the whole tenure of scriptures. And, and that is how good doctrine is established. And then point four, truth is always well balanced and sound. Truth always exalts Jesus Christ. Any teaching that degrades Jesus Christ are erroneous. And then five, truth always have a sanctifying effect in the life of a believer. And we just said it. A man's daily walk will tell whether or not he is a believer in the doctrine. So when we look at the teachings of the apostle, amen, when we look at the teachings of the apostle and look at what is happening in the, and I put in, in brackets, the church arena, when we look around us and some of the things that are happening, we can conclude without any shadow of a doubt that these, some, these things that we are seeing, that they are not scriptural. Amen. So truth always have a sanctified effect in the life of a believer and a man's Daily walk will tell whether or not he's a believer in the teachings of the apostle. A believer in the word of Jesus Christ. The word of wisdom comes from Proverbs 22 verses 8. It says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. If we can apply this to sound doctrine, the lesson is that we must preserve, keep it intact, and you will never stray from the truth. So biblical doctrine then help us to understand the will of God for our lives. It teaches us the natural, the, sorry, the nature and the character of God. It teaches us the path to salvation. It instructs the church. And it tells us 
of God's standard of holiness for our lives. When we accept the Bible as God's word to us, we accept the teachings of Jesus Christ. We accept the teachings of the apostle. 2 Timothy 2, verses 16, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for our doctrine. So when we teach and when we preach from the book and we exhort and we talk about the principles that are laid down in scripture by Jesus Christ and by the apostles, we are instructing in righteousness. We are declaring the doctrine that was set forth for us to follow in scripture. Our doctrine is important irrespective of what persons think and irrespective of the talk of, every, of coming together and putting aside what you believe, putting aside what you accept. Doctrine is important. And I say to the church tonight that we need to be clear in our mind what is it that we believe, hallelujah, and why is it that we believe it. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And that is why we mentioned earlier on as we wrap up the, the, this little thing and, 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 and the doctrine that it is not the word of men but it's the word of God hence the Holy Spirit is a good interpreter of the scriptures because the scriptures were written by the Holy Spirit the Bible says that holy men of God speak as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we have a solid foundation when we accept the teachings of the apostles, when we accept the teachings of Jesus Christ, when we embrace them, when we have them up in our heart, we have a solid foundation for our doctrine, and we have a solid platform on which we can launch our teachings and our preachings about Jesus Christ. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Are you convinced about what you are in? Hallelujah. I want somebody to be convinced in their mind tonight that what you are in is truth and what you are in is sure. What you have been hearing is of God. I want to tell somebody that you have a solid foundation. We have a solid foundation on which our doctrine is established. Anything that we talk about, and like I said earlier on, we are not able to cover everything. But when you look at the overall doctrine of the apostles, and they talk about the salvation of men, if you look from Genesis to Revelation, it is about the salvation of men. If they talk about one God, if you look from Genesis to Revelation, it is one God. If they talk about holiness from Genesis to Revelation, it is holiness. So I want us to understand that we have a sure footing, we have a sure foundation when we accept the word of God and when we accept the teachings of the apostles. Amen. So we... What is doctrine? What is the apostle's doctrine? We established a couple of weeks ago that doctrine is really teaching. And the teaching must be determined in the mind of, some, of, of individuals. It must be by someone that is learned or someone that is important. right? But at the same time, 
when we talk about the apostles doctrine we are talking about the apostles teaching and i've been mentioned mentioning that the teachings of the apostle the teachings that these men put forward were written in the scripture for our admonition these men wrote as the holy ghost move upon them so what we have today it is because of god and god's doing why we have the scriptures as they are so the teachings that paul peter john and the others are what we consider to be the apostles' doctrine. And if you look in the scriptures, whatever Paul said, whatever Peter said, whatever John said, all of the message are the same thing. And the Bible says in the book of Acts 2, verses 42, and let us look at that one. Acts 2, verses 42. It tells us that the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. I want you to understand, those listening to me, I want you to understand that you must continue steadfastly. No, is not the time to be looking to the left or to be looking to the right with everything that is happening around us. We must continue steadfastly in this doctrine that has been passed down to us. Continue in the doctrine. Continue in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers, almighty God, in a time like this, we better get up out of the bed. I just train a little bit. We better get up out, out of the sleep and slumber and find time to pray. We're not coming to we're not able to come out to church as we used to. Hence, we must increase our prayer life. We must at, be at our utmost best. Even when the flesh says, look here, I'm tired. Tell yourself, say, I'm getting up because I must talk to Jesus. It, we must continue in prayer. We must continue steadfastly in apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. The ESV says that, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers amen so these men that jesus christ unpicked these men that jesus christ selected for three and a half years, these men walked with him. He taught them. One of the time he sent them out and they came back with good reports. And all that he did for the three and a half years with those whom he selected was to teach them. And these men... When Jesus Christ left off the scene, began to preach the same thing that Jesus Christ was preaching. They began to do all the things that Jesus Christ commanded them to do. So, for three and a half years, Jesus taught these apostles. He instructed them what they should do. These men, from the time they were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to teach, began to preach, and to instruct with the word of God. A vital component of the apostles' doctrine is the plan of salvation. What does it take 
to be saved from God's wrath, which is to come. God's plan of salvation for mankind is comprised in the five basic components. Belief, repentance, water baptism, infilling of the Holy Spirit, and living a holy life. Can't be emphasized enough. So, like I said, we will not look at everything as it pertains to belief. We will not look at everything as it pertains to water baptism. We will not look at everything as it pertains to repentance, but we are just going to point out some of the, some of the main things so that we can have an understanding of the, the things that the apostles emphasize most. And then we are going to move on and we are going to look at the other doctrines that we mentioned. So the first one is belief. Belief in God is the first step in obtaining eternal salvation. And belief in God is critical and it's important to our walk in salvation. Belief plays a part in repentance. Belief plays a part in the baptism in Jesus' name. Belief plays a part in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Belief plays a part in living holy. Without faith, the Bible says. So let's look at that first scripture, Hebrews 11, verses 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, there is no pleasing God if there is no faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it's in, with, it is impossible to please God. Now let us look at this same Hebrews. Let us look at same chapter 11 from verse 1 to 6. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. In other words, though you don't have the thing, faith say you have it. Though you can't see it, faith says that you have it. It might seem foolish, but the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And God requires that any man come to him that that man must first believe. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offer unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. That he should and was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And back to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently 
seek him. The writer of the passage was clear on the point that the patriarchs pleased the Lord. He was clear on the point that the patriarchs pleased God because of their faith in him. Similarly, as individuals, there is no pleasing God without faith. Like the scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that God exists. So that by faith, we believe that the worlds were formed. So he that cometh to God must believe that God is. And that God is a reward of them that diligently seek him. The writer, as he wrote about these patriarchs, he mentions to us that these patriarchs were rewarded. He said that Abel obtained a witness that he was righteous. And while he was dead, yet speak it. So the reward was that he, was, he obtained a witness. Enoch received a reward. He was translated and he was not found. But before his translation, he had this saying that he pleased the Lord. I wonder if we can, can say that right now as I speak, that we please the Lord. Noah saved himself and his family because he believed the Lord. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we continue to seek him, and I like how the Holy Ghost prompted me a while ago to talk about prayer, if we continue to seek him, continue to fast, Continue to pray, not just when the church call a fasting because we're not meeting together. So, so when last are we fast? But if we continue to seek him, in due season he will reward us. Just as how we reward, we reward these patriarchs, God will reward us when we believe him. And seek him. He will reward us. And I'm not talking about rewarding physical things. In material things. But I'm talking about reward us as it pertains to our daily salvation. As it pertains to dying daily. Reward us because there is coming a time when he shall deliver us from this body of death completely. That is the type of reward that I'm talking about. So this fear that we use to please God comes by hearing. The Bible in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us this. That the faith that we use to please God comes by hearing. It says, so then, faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So faith in God can only be exercised when we hear the word of God. No man don't just take up himself like that and say, look here, I believe in God. It starts by that man hearing about God. Amen, somebody. It starts by that person, that individual hearing about God. And then when we look at Romans 10, verses 17. Romans 10, verses 17. It says, How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? So the word plays an important role in our believing God or our faith in God. So then it is by hearing the word of God we believe. By hearing the word of God preached, we now are able to exercise our faith in him because of the message that was presented to us. The same message. Christ died and was buried according to the scripture. He rose again on the third day according to the scripture. This message that is presented about his death, burial, resurrection and ascension is the message that caused us to believe in God. And here is where the goodness of God is revealed. This faith that we use to please him comes from him. Let us find Romans 12 verse 3. So the goodness of God is revealed in that this faith that we need to please God. For without faith it is impossible to please him. This faith that we use to please God comes from God. God give it to us. God give us faith. He is the source of our faith that we exercise in him. This faith did not come from our parents. We, we did not inherit this thing from our parents. So yes... We're born into this world. But it is God that gave us this faith to believe in him. The scripture teaches that God has given to every man the ability to believe. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man a measure of faith. So don't feel like you have the ability to believe God more than anybody else. God has given to every man a measure of faith. So because God is the source of our faith. He is the one that has given us this measure of faith. It therefore means that God is the source. We need faith to please him. And he gave it to us. We need faith for the working of salvation. And he gave it to us. We need faith to live by and he gave it to us because the just shall live by faith. I want us to know that the saving faith that we exercise in God is given to us by God. I, as I look on the passages, I recognize just how much God loves us. He provided salvation. And then we need faith to access that salvation. And he provided it. In our saying, we would say, boy, look here, we give you a horse. Find the sacrifice. But God gave us the horse, the horse. And he provided the saddle. Amen. He gave us the faith to access that salvation the bible also teaches that we are saved by grace through faith and let us look at ephesians 2 5 through to 9 
The Apostle Paul made it clear in the epistle to the Ephesians. Even when we were dead in our sins, at Christ quickly us together, by grace are we saved, and had raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Many folks right now believe that their good works will save them. And I've come across many folks who believe that their good works will save them. And so right now you have folks who are given to philanthropy because they believe that giving to the poor and giving to the needy is a, will help them to gain salvation. It is good to be able to give to the poor and to give to the needy and to give some scholarships. Because Jesus said the least, he said whatever you do unto the least of these, you do it unto me. So it's good. And there will be a reward. But not the reward of salvation. It doesn't matter the amount of good works an individual do. That amount of good works will not save him. And so when we go back to the Old Testament, we recognize that they had to offer up turtle doves and lambs and bullocks. But the blood of animals were not sufficient. For by grace are we saved through faith. Salvation is a free gift from God. Your physical labor, your giving, will not cause you to gain salvation. It is a gift from God to us. There is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. If we could do that, then God would not have sent his son to die in our stead. This free gift is what we call unmerited favor. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, emphasized that. We are saved by grace, this unmerited favor, through faith. So in other words, it's like I've been saying, we through faith access this salvation that God has provided for us. God is the one that purchased salvation for us through the death of his sons. And we accept this salvation by faith. So, by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So, though faith accesses the plan of salvation and access the salvation that God has provided for us. I want us to know that faith provides good works. So with works that we do can't save us and it will not amount to us getting salvation, but at the same time when we have faith in God and faith in the principles and the status of God, they produce good works works and let us turn to titus 3 verses 8 so though we are not saved by good works we must understand that faith produces good works this is a faithful saying and these things i will that though affirm 
constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable. You say, those which have believed in God must be careful to maintain good works because they are profitable. James picked it up. James 2 verses 14 to 17 to 24 and then 26. What doeth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Even so, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yeah. A man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So what James is saying, you know, look here. Yes, we access the salvation by faith. And the works that we do, it won't save us. But... He is now saying that, look here, the works that we do is as a result of our faith. And our faith will show the works. So in other words, if you believe God and your faith say, yes, I believe God that you exist. And now I recognize that I want to access salvation. The works now will follow, which means that we have to repent. We have to now get baptized, receive the Holy Spirit, and live a holy life. So show me your faith, and I will show you my works. Though believe it that there is one God, Thou doest well. The devil also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? And you look at this word now, you know. Because, look at the scripture again, because it says, He offered up Isaac. So we know the story, he put Isaac on the altar. And his faith said, look here, even if me kill the seed of the promise, God is able to raise him up again. So he did not offer him in the physical, but in the spirit, he was already offered. And the man feared, said, look here, if, if I offer him, God is able to raise him up. And James now talking about it, says that he offered Isaac. upon the altar and it's by faith so the works was there yes but his faith was also there see though how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled with said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. He see then how that by works a man is justified. And not by faith only. 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Once belief in God is established, that belief will prompt us to take action. That action to discover what the will of God and the desire of God is for my life. And then to put those desires in place in your life. The only place to discover this plan in your life is through the word of God. The scriptures, the Bible. If you want to have life, and if you want to please God, it is in the scripture. And so it is by faith that we believe that the word, the scriptures, are given by God. And then when we hear the scriptures minister, we believe that, look here, there is a God and him exists. And that is why some people find it so hard because look here, I'm saying, can't believe in God. He tries to find some explanation for God. What is by faith? Without faith, it is impossible to please give the foolishness of God. God requires faith. It might look foolish, it might look simple, but look here. This is what God requires, and if God requires it, I can't go around it. I must just give to God what he deserves. And if God says faith is what is going to please me, faith is the currency that I am dealing with, then faith, we just have to just believe God. Amen. So once belief in God is established, then that belief will prompt us to do something else. So what else is there for me to do? So we said that the, the, the major things that the apostle deal with were faith. And they spend a long time, a whole lot of scriptures talk about faith. And if we look at faith, we recognize that it is consistent throughout the scripture. Though we did not see the Bible mentioned, I think it was one time faith was mentioned in the Old Testament. But if you look in the New Testament, you see where it's mentioned a whole lot of time. But yet still the scripture that we read mentioned the patriarchs and they mentioned how they believed God. And it was imputed unto them for righteousness. So though faith was not mentioned, faith was there and it is what God requires. And once we believe God, once that faith in God is established, then it will prompt us to do the next thing. The, 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 the things that we are focusing on, faith, and then the next thing is repentance. So let us move on to repentance. God has been consistent throughout the Old and the New Testament with his call to sinful men to repent. From ever since the fall, Adam sinned, and through Adam, sin entered into the world as a people, generation upon generation, we were in the loins of Adam. And because Adam sinned, all mankind fell. And this teaching is consistent throughout the scriptures. If we look at Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man is taught. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. So the call of God is there. Let us look at Ezekiel 18. 30 to 32. 
So God has been consistent with his call. Therefore, will I judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way, ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So repent and turn yourselves so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby he hath transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will he die, O house of Israel? So this is a call now to Israel and nation. In so far, I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, or in the death of him that died in sin. Say the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live. So there's a call from ever since God has been calling individuals. He has been calling nations, and he did it in the Old Testament, and he did it in the New Testament. And in, even today, there is still a call. Let us go down to Joel 2, verses 13. There is still a call today. And rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger. And of great kindness. And repented him of the evil. Jonah 3 verses 10. When God saw what they did. So we know the story of Jonah. God said to Jonah the prophet, look here, go down to Nineveh, preach to them. But no, Jonah did not want to go down to Nineveh because, look here, he knew that if the people repented, that God would turn. He tried to run away, but in the end went and preached the gospel. When God saw that they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. John the Baptist. The forerunner of Jesus Christ. Came preaching repentance. Matthew 3. 1 and 2. In those days. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And saying repent ye. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, 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 and you know why I'm going through the Old Testament. And then I'm coming into the New Testament. It, because I want you to see that the things that the apostle taught. The doctrine of the apostles. That it was preached. By the prophets, there was a call for the people of old to repent. There was a call for nation to repent. The forerunner now of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, preached repentance. And look here now. Matthew 4, verses 17. Jesus himself, when he walked the earth, preached repentance. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The apostles in Acts 2 verse 38 also preached repentance. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, from the Old Testament, God has been calling man to repent. In the New Testament, he's still calling men to repent. In today's church era, he's still calling men to repent. How will they repent? Remember now we said earlier on, how will they repent? If they don't hear the word, it's when they hear the word, now they start 
believe in God and when they now exercise this faith in God, faith will now prompt them to do something else. And this is what the apostles taught. So what is repentance? It is a change of one's mind. It is both being sorry for sins and an act of turning from sin and dedicating oneself to God. When a person is repented, he changes his mind from exalting himself to exalting Christ. So one person will ask, why do I need to repent? It's simple. Romans 3, verses 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why? Romans 5 verse 12. There is a death sentence. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Why? Because... Psalms 51 verse 5. We were born in sin. Though this was King David that was confessing his sins to God. The saying is true for all men. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. So though it is because some person will say, boy, look here, I do, I do things. I am a peaceful person. I don't curse. I live peaceably with all men. But the fact still remains that we were born in sin and we were shaped in iniquity. This old Adamic nature we have adapted that from our four parents. So what is it that we need to know about repentance? One, there must be recognition. Before someone can repent, they must recognize that they are a sinner or recognize the wrong that he has done. And scripture for that, Romans 5 verses 12 that we just read, and Romans 3 verses 23. So a person must recognize that he's a sinner. It, 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 and this is the reason why we deliver the word, because we want an individual to recognize that, yes, you are in sin. So without the recognizing that they are in sin, they cannot take the next step that should be taken. So the first thing is for an individual to recognize that they are sin. And we say that we're not going with us, going through. Right? The second thing is that there must be godly sorrow. And this godly sorrow is feeling sorrowful regret or remorse over sins committed. And this is why the sinner's prayer cannot work. Anybody wants to be saved, you can come to the altar. Pray this prayer. Lift your right hand and pray this prayer with me. And when the prayer is prayed, you are now saved. But that is not scriptural because there is a call from the Old Testament for repentance. And there is a call in the New Testament for repentance. 
and if the person recognizes that he's a sinner, but there is no godly sorrow, then that prayer to say, God save me, is null and void. Because when it comes to repentance, there must be godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. Now I rejoice, not that he were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. For he were made sorry after a godly manner, that he might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow work at repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work it death. So the person must feel that kind of sorrow that will lead to repentance. The scripture says, Godly sorrow work at repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Amen. The next thing that a person needs to know is that they must confess their sins. And I want you to know that God knows everything. He is omniscient and he knows everything. But God still requires man to confess. How he works it that way, I don't know. But this is what he requires. He requires that men confess their sins. If we take a look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it tells us, He that confesseth his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh. So there must be a confession. And there must be a forsaking. And it's only then that the individual will have mercy. I am saying to us, because a lot of people, you know, they go to some place, some building set up, and some men in robe, and these men tell them that, look here, just pray the prayer and you are now saved. You're not saved. And, just, if, if, and if it's the same Bible that you believe in, it is the same one that I'm presenting from. God requires that we confess and he requires that we forsake them. And then shall we have mercy. And we must also understand that confession is made directly to God. And not to any man. So when we have this system set up that um, individuals need to come to a priest to confess their sins. The Bible doesn't teach that. Oh glory to God. We're putting down now as we get into the word. Putting down some of these things that men have as practices. And men have as doctrine. It is not scriptural. This is why going to a physical priest to confess one sin is wrong. The Bible says it is only God alone that can forgive sins. When you go to the priest to confess the sins, what is the priest going to do? He's going to go to God on your behalf and say, look here, Lord, forgive Brother Bailey because Brother Bailey has sinned. Oh God, the Bible says he that can confess it and forsake it is sin. Confess them to God. Hallelujah. Because it's God alone. Can forgive sins. Isaiah 43 verses 25. And Mark 2 verses 7. Isaiah 43. Him say. I. Even I am. He that blotted out thy transgression. For mine own sake. 
and will not remember thy sins. So look here. It is God and God alone that can forgive sins. I even I am he. Glory. That blotted out thy transgression. So you don't have to carry your confession to any priest in a box. Glory to God. You don't have to keep, you have to just go down on your knees right where you are and confess your sins to God. Amen. And God is faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. Mark 2 verses 7. Why? Why do it this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? So this was Jesus. No, you know. And, and if you look at the scripture, if you go down in it, you can get a little bit into the God. This was Jesus now. Forgive. This man wanted healing, but Jesus forgive him of his sins. Right? And there was an argument. And Jesus said, which one is more important? And the, these Pharisees said, who can forgive sins? But God, so they know the word says only God alone can forgive sin. But they did not recognize that this was God before them. So look here. It is God alone that we need to go to to for, ask for forgiveness. He that confess them and forsake them. But when we confess them, we must confess them to God. When a priest, you confess to a priest, somebody, a priest, him can pray and say, remember, Brother Bailey, because Brother Bailey sin, But God requires that Brother Bailey come to him and say, look here, this God is a personal God. He's a one-on-one -on -one God, and it's a God that wants a relationship with us as individuals. I want you to understand that it might be 10 billion persons serving God, irrespective of the amount God is big enough to take time out for every individual. He's a one-on-one -on -one God. And God require us to come and confess our sins to him. The next point, point four, that I want to mention is the point of restitution. As a part of forsaking sins, the truly repentant person will seek to correct the impact of his past sins upon others to the extent possible. Very important. I... Remember years ago as a young Christian, I had this friend. This friend was at the altar for years, could not receive the Holy Ghost. And as I went to work one day, I prayed for this friend. And the Lord said to me, tell that person that why they have not received the Holy Spirit is because they need to make restitution. I saw that individual the evening and I said to that person, I have something to say to you. But then in my mind as a young Christian, I was kind of questioning God and I'm saying, God, look here, I'm not going to say it. And in that prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit talked to me again and said, look here, when the prayer meeting finished, that person is going to come to you. And so said as the prayer meeting finished, this individual came over. And I feel, I, 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 I said, look here, I'm just going to say what the Lord told me to say. The reason why you have not got the Holy Ghost yet is because there is some form of restitution that you need to do. And I tell him, in my mind, I was wondering, you know, if, 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 if yes, if it was God that really wanted me to say it. But when I saw him came over, I know that, look here, this was what God wanted. And I tell you, the individual came back to me a couple of weeks and he said, you know you're talking truth? He said, there were three individuals that lived in my community. And I hated them. We had an argument and I cursed them out. And I want you to know that this individual... This individual, after that, he said, look here, I can't find one of the persons. I can't find one of the persons. And I said, look here, don't worry about it. God see your heart now and God know because God talked to you. And the point, a part of forsaking of sin is the truly repented person will seek to correct the impact of his past sin to others. Two, 
the possible extent, this possible extent that this young man find two, but could not find the third. And shortly after that, this young man got the Holy Ghost, and this young man was at the altar for years. The Bible says, Luke 19, verses 8. Zacchaeus stood and said, because Zacchaeus was a short man, went up into a tree. Jesus, as he was passing, Jesus, as he was, he said, Zacchaeus, come down tonight, I shall come in thine house. And Zacchaeus' heart was at the place, look here, and Zacchaeus said, look here. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Because he's before the Lord and his heart is at a place. And he recognizes how he gain, what he gain. And he said, Lord, I will give away the half. And he said, if I've taken anything from any man by a false accusation, I restore unto him fourfold. Hallelujah. Therefore, Matthew 5. 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and be rememberest that thy brother hath art against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer that gift. In other words, if you, you and somebody ha have a little contention, have a little bit of disagreement and it bring vexation, what the Bible is saying, look here, don't come to God before you make it right with your brother. And this is restitution. And I want to say to those who are tuning in and is seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, two things can stop you from receiving the Holy Spirit. You are not repented or your faith is not at the point. I want somebody to understand that a part of repentance, a very important part, is what we call restitution. If you are able to, according to the extent, then we must try to make it right with those who we offend. I believe and I feel in my spirit that, you know, somebody will look into what is being said and will get it right. Restitution is an important part of it. Verse 25 of that same passage, it says, Agree with thine adversary quickly. While thou art in the, while thou art there with the adversary, with your adversary, agree with him. Just to save any future, in the future that you have to go back to him and say, Look here, forgive me. But while he's there with you, agree with him. I want us to know that repentance is extremely important. And it is one of the things that the, 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 the apostles taught about. It is one of the things that they preached about and that they taught about. And it has been passed down to us. I want you to know that there is no getting to heaven there is no being saved except a man is repent, repented of his sins. It is just what God requires. And tonight I want to stop here. Next week as we come, we will look at, just cover briefly like our cover this because we know that repentance can take one study or probably more than one study. But we just go through some of the main points. And the same thing that we are going to do with water baptism and we are going to do with the infilling of the Holy Ghost so that we can get an understanding of the doctrine that the apostles preach. And we are just going to mention some other things 
because the apostles talk about the holiness, they talk about, you know, one God, and they talk about love. So we're just going to mention briefly some of those things. But then now we are going to get into the other doctrines, and we are going to find how these doctrines now try to destroy what the apostles taught and what Jesus himself had, had taught. Because the adversary's aim is to come in, to disguise himself as an angel of light, and to destroy as many that he can destroy. What I want to tell us tonight as people of God, I want to tell us tonight as the church, that we should stand firm in our belief. Don't let anyone tell you to put your doctrine aside. The apostles, Jesus himself, talk about it. The apostles talk about it. Hold on to what has been passed down unto you. God bless you tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. Just bow your heads. Lord, we thank you, great God, for what was presented. Lord Jesus, we pray, God, that you will continue to bless each and every heart. Lord Jesus, God, that you will touch God's lives, God, even those who will tune in to this word, oh God, in the future. Lord Jesus, as we go through, God, presenting this doctrine, this apostle's doctrine, we pray, God, that you will help us to stand, stand resolute, great Jesus, oh God, and fight for what we have believed. We have seen, God, what is happening around us. Everything is changing, God. Hallelujah, God. And people, God, who have uh, known the truth, Jesus, they have turned unto fables. But, oh God, we look to you tonight. We ask, God, that you will touch hearts again, that you will touch minds, touch spirit, and that you will cause individuals to hold on to the truth. Those who have turned, oh God, from the truth, Touch them one more time, God, that they will turn to the truth. We pray, God, that you will continue to bless tonight and continue to keep. And that your perfect will be done among your people. Lord God, even as we are in the midst of pandemic, we pray, God, that you continue to guide, continue to keep, continue to protect your people. Oh, Lord Jesus, no plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. And that is the word of God. We pray that we will embrace your words. And that your will be done and your will be accomplished as we give you thanks right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And let the church say in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands one time. Amen. Amen. Just lift your hands one time. We give you glory, God. We give you honor. We give you praise, Jesus. And we thank you, oh God, for this apostles' doctrine. We thank you that, hey, God, that you have a plan of salvation, a plan, oh God, mighty Jesus, what you used to save man. And I thank you, God, that I've come to know you through this plan. And anyone tuning in tonight, you are not saved. You have not repented of your sins. You have not been baptized in the name of Jesus. You have not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But you have even done all of that, and you are not living holy. Tonight is the night. You can make it right. Tonight is the night that you can accept the Lord, that you can get it right in the name of the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name. I love you in Jesus' name. I just feel I love you. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of announcement. So there was a trip planned with our young people based on the restrictions that have been implemented by our Prime Minister. That trip is off it is not cancelled but it is postponed whenever time things are open up back and we have some semblance of norm then you know we will as soon as possible put back that trip on and we will go and we'll fellowship with our young people and we'll get to go through the things that we wanted to go through and then this friday august the 27th we have the pan chicken buzz. And I am going to ask if you are able to purchase a ticket or two, I'm going to ask you to do so. It is for a good cause. It is in aid of the back to school, the church back to school program. And we want to support 
as many of our children and our young people that are going back to school. We want to support as many. So I am going to ask us, as many as possible, if you can purchase one or two tickets, lunch will be ready as early as 11 a.m. So you can walk by, you can ride by, you can drive by. And no gathering, we stick into the protocols. And we're just going to ask you to just support the cause. Amen. God bless you one more time. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.